Hey folks, it's Nick. I'm here with a man that needs no introduction, J.M. Fortier. Thank you for having us. Thank you for at, coming at down. At this wonderful location. This is great. Yeah, we're we're at the Old Mill yep. and we're staying at the Cecil House, which is on property. Uh, if you could, just could you walk us through what this particular project is? Yeah, the Old Mill is my new farm project. I started this yeah, mill of last year. Uh, so you're, we're more than a year in and it's an acre market garden that you see right there. Uh, winter greenhouses growing uh, greens all winter and it's connected to the old mill which is a restaurant right so it's a farm to table restaurant and it has like you say five rooms and the kitchen is right there we can see it from here and that's five minutes from my home farm that's perfect so for me that project was about connecting farming my farming with kitchen which I really appreciate and like I've been working with chefs for all these years and creating a space where we talk about agroecology, where people can visit the gardens, when people can eat. It's 100% local. So the restaurant is 100% from the area here. The salt comes from the St. Lawrence a bit north. We have a few bottles of French wine because we're, we're like that here. But besides that, the chefs, the, the team, there's eight of them. They cook 100% local food. And uh, it's just amazing. We have people from all over coming down for fine food, for good food, for good times, walk in the gardens and... Well, you know, when, you, when you're on the road, you either sleep great because you're just what we're out or you're not sleeping at all. We got in last night and we we're, we're out. So everything was very, very peaceful. The grounds are just yeah, perfect. You, you, could, you could hear the waterfall, eh? I couldn't, but from my room, but yeah. I, I think from other rooms you probably could. But it, yeah, it was, um, the, the whole grounds is very peaceful. I've been to a lot of farms. And the thing that strikes me about this is there's, there's places to sit and contemplate and places to gather everything's super clean it's just there's it seems like there's room enough for anything you'd want to do here so just a few words about that's great i'm, I'm happy is that the, the design of this place is to have people here to host and to make people you know when when we do the meals like sometimes i'll go and i'll go in the gardens and i'll show people where the veggies come from i'll tell them what this is what that is and you know for this is my 20th season in farming for my first 12, I was at my home farm, La Grelinette, not far from here, as an acre and a half farm. And when my book came out, The Market Gardener, it got really popular. And I started to give a lot of lectures and touring. And, and then what would happen is that people would come to my farm. And then, you know, you'd have people in my windows and... Your home. Yeah, my home. It's like it's... It, and so for... That happened for a year or two, and then at the end, we're like, okay, we don't want any visitors here, never. Right. Uh, we have a young family. My, my wife, she's totally not into that. Very private person. So that, that aspect of hosting and, and sharing I just couldn't happen. And then I went and I started another farm project where I teach 10, uh, 10 young farmers for two years. So it's a big teaching ground, FQT farm. And then that's owned by a millionaire, a billionaire. And so there's a gate and you can't get in. Right. So for almost 20 years, like, or 10, 10, 10 ish years, I, I was somewhat in the public eye. I have a TV show here in, in Quebec. So people, you know, they, they, they'd like to connect with me. I, unless I was at farmer's market, I didn't have the room or space to talk to anyone. And so I just felt like I wanted to open up. As we go through this interview, you know, we'll we'll talk about diversified income streams and what life looks like as we start aging up, and and this seems just like the perfect natural progression for you to have that outlet for those not only revenue streams but for things you're obviously called to do. Yeah, and then obviously when we're talking like this and it's a sunny day, this is all roses. <laughs> but that project came with a lot of stress. Of course. And at some point, I was I I was really not sure that I would. I would actually pull it through. And, but, and uh, but I used to say you, <laughs> that would have happened year three, year four, where you're still getting all the infrastructure in and getting your feet under you and trying out new crops. And it, it seemed like a, a perfect transition later on in the career. Yeah, it is. Like I'm 45 now. So I'm thinking I have at least seven good years of hard work. Then I'd like to perhaps mellow out a little bit. I still want to farm for a long time, but I just. I, I didn't want to be on the beat also of uh, six days a week, farmer's market at five in the morning, uh, you know, running a crew of 10 people 
for seven years was a lot of work for me, a big commitment of my time and energy. Here it's a bit different. Like I, I have some spare time to just be here and, and be of presence, talking to people. I have, you know, I had one apprentice here for the summer. That was great. Spent a lot of time with her. Actually, we went and had beers on Friday lunch. That for me was like, it's Friday noon and we're having a beer. It's nice. And then we will go back to work after that. But I'd never did that before. Like, right. That was not part of, that was not possible. Well, the purpose of this interview for us is like, it's, we, we knew that you've been asked these same questions over and over and over again and talk. And, and so what I kind of wanted to skew this whole conversation on is we're, we're post pandemic. We are, I believe that we're at a crossroads of, of some in which the cream is going to start rising to the crop. We're going to see more people specialize in certain things. And so I just, just kind of picking your brain on things that we think about here at Bootstrap Farmer mm -hmm. and, uh, and just get your take on it. Sure. So I, I know that there's a big push for education, not only online, but working with universities and colleges yep. And, yep. and some secondary institutes. So as that delineates down in the future and we're looking at possibly getting that into like a, a high school type thing, I, I don't know what the equivalent to high school would be called here, but these vocational programs that are already in place, how can we start normalizing, normalizing that as a career path uh, for younger and younger people? Well, yeah, that's a big question. So if we were, you and I, you know, head of state or, or minister of agriculture or whatever, I think the best way to educate young people, especially like kids, is for them to be in it. Like if you have a kindergarten, I'd, ha I'd like to have the garden. If you have a high school, why not? Why, why wouldn't the high school have a garden? And the, the garden feeds, you know, the cafeteria. And then that cuts down on costs. It's just, you're making sure that the students are eating healthy greens, healthy foods. Like, and honestly, like if you look at the size of this thing here, that feeds the restaurant year round. And that's like, you know, that's a lot of people throughout the year. For sure. Uh, it's like 60 heads, uh, you know, four, four times a week. That would be kind of the, for me, like that would really be awesome. And then having classes where people go and they do nursery, they do potting up, they do these things. They need to do it. You know, for, for, for kids to feel it, they need to do it. And yeah, that's my, that's my answer. Well, this is a, this is a great place to uh, further investigate this line of topic because it, it's not just the growing, is it? It's the hospitality aspect. Mm -hmm. You guys are running a, an Airbnb and a, and a bed and breakfast at the same time. The restaurant needs people to wash the dishes. They need people for procurement and to make sure that everything's here on time yep. and, and then cooked properly. Um, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of compliance that takes place as far as food safety and what you can and can't do on property. And you're you, but your team still has, oh, yeah. you're still, your team <laughs> still has to get out and promote this to some degree, yep. you know, because you want people coming from far and wide and, and local is certainly going to be a, a part of who you want to have come and enjoy this. So as we're talking about real world experience at these vocationals, it's not just the growing, it's the management of it and how are we hiring and, and how do you, how do you train somebody and how do you keep up with what you're supposed to do for employees? It's, there's so much more involved, ergo, the opportunity for secondary education or primary education. There is, to at least and, tee it up. and and you've really, you've really, you know, nailed it with the fact that there's all these secondary things that aren't secondary, like administration of something like this. Like there's 25 employees, right? So you know the payroll, the HR. There's so many. The thing is, there's a lot of people out there that have these skills, that have skills in management that have skills in running businesses, that have skills in, in running public spaces. And th that's where the grower needs to join force because the grower should be doing the growing. Like I do some of the admin and I do a little bit of work here and there and I, I do steer like the teams because I have a lot of experience in team building and, and team leading. But that's where coming together in a community, in a project, is really important because you can't do it all. Right. Like I would not recommend doing something like this and if you don't have very supportive folks. Right. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about skill set. Like caring. You know, and caring, management <laughs> skills, administrative skills. Like this is, 
this is like a two two and a half million dollar project just to get it going right so understanding loans understanding you know cash flow understanding what it means to be viable in year four and how you get to that how to choose the right insurance i mean it it's never just, ever so ends. much to it and then keeping up on top of hey how do we design this thing so when people come here they feel welcome it's everything they wanted it to be and more yeah it's a big part of it and then not you know and, and for this place not having the money to just kind of do whatever it's like this is not a public park right we're funding this with the business and so the garden needs to be kicking vegetables that you know is a down is a cost that the kitchen doesn't have because we're you know we're direct selling everything um but there's a lot that goes through it but the impact is amazing you really see it like the people that come here they walk the gardens they eat the food they they sleep at the Cecil house they hang out here and it's like and to be clear, you, you don't just fall into this place. There, it's we're a little bit from any major airport. Yeah, it's yeah, a drive, and yeah. what a outstanding drive this has been. Just uh, this area is amazing. But uh, I, I feel that the people that would be drawn here could appreciate everything from wherever they start to landing here. An hour drive from Montreal, a bit more than an hour from Burlington, Vermont. This village, Stanbridge, is one of the last Anglophone village of Quebec. Meaning that here in Quebec, we speak French. Like the road signs are all in French. I've noticed. You can't really understand anything. It's like, this is another country. And it's Canada, but it's another country kind of in Canada. But here in San Regis, it was until recently 100% Anglophones that lived here. These were the loyalists that when, you know, there was the independent war, independence war with, with Britain, a lot of people that were loyal to the queen came here. To set, I think it was the king back then, but they settled here in Canada. And so this village where we're at is very different and has a different vibe to how it's shaped. Uh, the mill is where all the farmers would bring their grains. And so they, it has a, a lot of history. And, uh, I, you know, for sure, like if you look at the building, we've kept it kind of oldish style. And we tell that story also because the history of people here is farming. And, uh, you know, we want to go back to that. And it, it's more than evident. I mean, like I said, just the thing I, I was talking to uh, the person that was with me is back home or in the States, you drive across the country and you, and you see regions of cotton and regions of corn and regions of soybean. And here, every other, there, there was a different crop mm. every plot. And I thought that was a very nice thing to see. It's not perfect. I would argue that because I see a lot of corn, too much corn. Right. But, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. We, it's the work of what you're doing, you know, I'm doing, all the people out there working in small-scale farming. It's, it's, having, it's having an impact. You know, and I think some of that impact is not only at the vocational level that we're talking about training the next round of farmers and, and all the other jobs that could come with farming, but it's also going from hey, mass market farming creates mass market buyers. How do people like us and, and the people that, you know, we like to associate ourselves, mm -hmm. how can we create a mass market or a, a more local vor type yeah. of appetite and acceptance of food and not just, I'm going to run and do the easiest thing every single time. Yeah, and that, that whole idea is, is what I'm all about, probably yourself also. And that idea is hard for people that are not in that space to kind of, wrap their head of mine, their, their head around. But my, my favorite example of how this can happen is with microbrewery. Like they didn't, they didn't exist like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there was a few, but not much. And you would have the beers that were served were like, there was like seven beers, you know, Coors, Bud Light, Molson here, you know, all these big breweries. And now like you, there's like 300 different breweries just here in Quebec. It's amazing. And that has created a lot. You went to the Dunham Brewery. We did. We so, did. you know. Good call. Yeah. And that, that wasn't there when I got here. Uh, you know, be, their beer is everywhere and th that of others also. There's like four other local breweries now in the area. That's, that's the local economy at work. And it's, it's like beers that are very different, diverse. 
it's it's flavorful, it's colorful, it's it's cultural. Then the question becomes with collaborations, you know, where are these hops coming from? Where are the grains coming from? Yeah, we're making a beer with them. Like this, all my carrots, there's going to be a frost in the next few weeks. And then the carrots, when they freeze, they get very, very sweet. They concentrate their sugars. And so we're making a beer with those carrots. And just like the example earlier, look at look at all the things that's that's going to bring just by being here. Yep. You know, the, like you said, the jobs, the opportunities, the the place for the local community to come meet. It it just keeps getting better and better. The and look, that's that scarcity mindset we see a lot. It's like, well, if there's competition, what happens? You know, hopefully everybody's getting better from it and getting encouraged by by it. Yeah, because the scarcity mindset is not is the wrong mindset because supermarkets are filled. Uh, you know, these big companies, the corporations, they're market shares for us to grab because we have a better message, because we're locally inclined, because culturally it's more aligned with how we want to live our lives. Like, you know, making wine, drinking wine, okay. Drinking natural wine from a winemaker that is doing amazing stuff here, it's not the same. Yeah. It's, it's, there's, uh, you know, vegetables. And and Meats, also with you know? the with the way the seasons change, like uh, there's a place in Dallas that I like to go to, and they have a drink called the grapefruit. It's a, a grapefruit martini. In Texas, we grow grapefruits, and throughout the season, that same drink will change because nice. it gets sweeter, it gets lighter, it gets darker, and and that that same relationship with any winemaker or olive oil producer or yes. anything like that, it's a big deal. It's, it's that's that's what that's what living is about. It's about family. It's about community. And it's about, you know, being culturally doing things together that have purpose. And especially when we're talking about climate change and it's like social uprest and everything that's going wrong. It's like what's left is to, for us to come together, build community, eating better foods for our health, producing healthier foods through our farming techniques. Like for me, all of this is just makes so much sense. And here you see it at work. Right. There's. It's, oh, it's ex when, extremely evident. When, when I moved here, there was one other organic farm. And he, at that time, not anymore, but at that time, he had that scarcity mindset. You're coming here, you're taking my market. And he completely flipped. And he's probably trained half of the young new farmers that are here himself. We did a bunch too at our home farm. But now here, there's like 40 different small farms, like just like around here. And we've created a local economy. We have Wednesday farmer night at the local cafe. Now I'm opening a farm to table. There's a local brewery. There's, there's, a, there's a cafe here that's open. It's just like, it's happening. You, you mentioned a bit ago that we have a message. And you've mentioned community a couple of times. <laughs> Whether you intended to or not, for 20 years, you've been an ambassador for, for small farming just as, as a whole. And I think that every time somebody logs onto social media or they open a farm and, and they're the feel good story for local or regional media, or even when somebody asks a farmer what they do for a living, that we're all playing the role of this ambassador. Mm -hmm. That's so and true. with That's so true. With where we're at in in the world right now, each one of us has I, I believe a great responsibility to be a proper ambassador, not just for that farm, but for, but for everybody. Yeah. So if, if you could give some words of encouragement on maybe taking a beat before you answer or, or uh, you know. No, but, but I agree so much because the reason why organic farming became mainstream and now it's co-opted. You can talk about, late, about that later if you want or not. It doesn't matter. But it's because there's people going at farmers. There's farmers, young farmers or not so young farmers, people going at farmers market telling the story of organics and then meeting with clients and talking to customers, hundreds of thousands of us doing that every Saturday morning. Like when I load up my truck in the morning, I think about all these other, I think about all my friends. Right. That you know, I, now I have friends in Germany. I have friends, you know, in Quebec. I have a lot of them in Canada, the U.S. Like we're all loading the truck Saturday morning. We're all going to farmer's market. We're all hoping to come back with a big pile of cash. But what we're doing is just talking about farming. We're just being good ambassadors for it. And man, that goes a long way. Right. You've really nailed it. That's so true. 
this is a this is a, a, such a small industry, but there's so many different segments, and we all cling to to whatever we're about. You know, microgreen farmers they mm. they tend to think along the same lines. No-till guys tend to think along the same. We're all a part of it. Do you have any thoughts on maybe thinking just a little bit outside of your niche and encompassing all small farms or like what what I'm no I, I like where you're going. What I see is sometimes true. is is uh, at different far, farmers markets. You know, if a vendor gets in a little dust up, but you can feel it in the air. Maybe yeah. you don't hear it or you don't see it, but it's like some something's off. And how can these farmers like respect that discipline within small ag and and vice versa? It's got to be dialogue. It's got to be talking. But if we are going to be ambassadors, we all have to have like a UN of farmers for in some regard. Yeah, well, I think it's always a question of being respectful for others, even though like you can be a Democrat or a Republican doesn't mean you can be a jerk with, with right. other people about it. You know, it's you can have your religious values, but that doesn't mean you want to impose them on others. But like for farmers, like I like the way you say those no-till folks. <laughs> They've really become quite of a group now. It's very ideological in many ways. But if it's not that, it could be, it could be you know, the people that are in biodynamics. or There's, there's groups within the group. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you were to say, JM, now you're, you're getting older, a, a bit wiser. Oh, I'm going to say that later. Don't worry. But <laughs> it's like, I think it's being respectful is very important. Right. Like, very important. Like, if you're being disrespectful, either on social media or in comments, everyday comments, like that's, that's not okay. Like, because it's hard work for everyone and you can be not in perfect alignment with what the other's doing. And you can, we can combat a few things. Power over needs to be fought against. Right. But between ourselves and the small scale farming circle, we shouldn't tolerate people being intolerable. We shouldn't tolerate be people, I think that has faded away, but being part of the cancel culture. Like for me, that was very hard to swallow when I saw that happening. And I just think it's disrespectful. And we should not go there. We should go into, you're different, I'm different. You know, you're from the US, I'm from Quebec. We should have a beer and get along. And if we talk about politics, perhaps we won't get along. Perhaps we will. It doesn't matter. Like we're, you know, we're, we're trying to solve the problem here, which is people are being fed nasty food by corporations because the profit gain is there. And we're an alternative to that. And we're building community. And, you know, we're all hopeful for a lifestyle. So we're all in it together. And then wouldn't it be nice if we could tack on being respectful with curiosity. Yeah. What's this other person yeah. doing? What's it taste like? Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, well, that's where you see the people that are the more interesting person, people. They're the, they're the curious people out there. Like, if you, if you go to a farm and you're looking for what's wrong, or if you're looking for what's different and, and idea, you know, new, it's not the same mindset. You know? And then, isn't it funny? You and I have been to farms everywhere many farms mm -hmm. and you always see something clever always 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 i just came back from europe i was i visited six farms and picked up the few things you know how to how the drip tape was wrapped at the end it was super clever i had never seen that before i you know new clips for the tomatoes like you always see these little things how the door the hinges work you go to the local tool shop when you're in uh, germany Oh yeah, it's just it's like be these, way these, different. These the tolerances. Are, yeah, it's yeah. like tools that are very different. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. One thing I always like to ask is uh, that birds make a cameo appearance. Yeah, <laughs> they always do. Cue the birds, everybody. One thing we like to ask is, I feel like there's a moment that farmers that don't grow up in agriculture that that are doing it now, they have this taproot moment. And, and maybe it wasn't, hey, I'm going to farm now, but there's, an, there's always this window shot of time in which the whole journey begins. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when that was for you and, mm -hmm. and what the instance was? Everybody seems to. I remember. It was a beautiful moment because we were in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And, you know, we had been volunteering on a farm. This guy was French, Canadian. And he was at the Santa Fe farm. He was a salad king. 
in Santa Fe. Like everybody would line up to get his salad mix. He would cut each leaves of his salad heads with a scissor. And then he, these were big, broad leaves, sturdy leaves, and then he would mix them up and have beautiful salad mix. And so we, we worked there for a little while, and then we worked for another farm. And when we left, there was a party after almost two years there. And at that party, honestly, there was about 60, 30 to 60 people, half of them young, from that community of farmer, farming. And that sense of being together was so delightful. That's why we decided that's what we want to do. Probably because we were connecting with community for the first time group of like-minded people that are positive because we were we were anarchists and we were rebellious in the fact that we're fighting politics at university but and then when we came back here that didn't exist there was one other farm as i said he wasn't the most excited about us being here and you know there was no cafe there was no there was no nothing but santa, we, but, santa fe is so old everything yeah is there. and then the, the old hippies were there the old spiritual dudes were there and do that. So there was a vibe to it that was great. And then that was what we had in our hearts and that we brought back here. And now 20 years later, we've created this, not just us, but we've been part of this right. here. And, and so that for me is what I try to share when I go elsewhere. You know, bringing people together, making them feel that we're a group here. We're all, we're all wishing for this to happen. And uh, we're like-minded more than not. You don't know this about me. I, I'm so glad you told me that story. I'm from New Mexico. Oh, you and are. I'm like people that, that know me and know us. I mean, that's a big part of who I am is that is that identity. So to hear that it started back there, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Me. And, Thank and you. you know, I, I, I almost had a little tear there because I really remember how it it really impacted us. Right. And, and you know, and, and there was this also this old farming community of um, near Española and all of these places. They're they're not even they're they're not Latinos. They're you know they're they've been there. They're Spanish. Like they've been there right. for like three hundred years, and the way they operated in the community was also super beautiful. So at some point, I expect the three sisters to get start getting grown here. <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we'll we'll take fish from the river. <laughs> Along that same taproot kind of thinking and and digging back into the past and and obviously the experience with with the people that you're around was there. Uh, a tide that was turned from a piece of advice from somebody that had a lot of years under their belt that, that kind of, uh, I'm sure it's happened so many times you can't even count, but was what's the most significant one that you can recall at this moment? Uh, in farming? And it doesn't even have to be farming related. It's all tied together. Yeah, the, a lot of my favorite quotes, a lot of my favorite, um, you know, quotes are just like... They, they come from Elliot Coleman. Because when I was a young grower, I was looking for answers about what, how to do what we were doing. And that was pre-internet. So I, I was reading Elliot Coleman. I was listening. And then internet came. And then we, I was listening to his, his chats, his courses, his, his talks. I visited him many times. And he seemed to always be saying one thing that I really you know, that's like, okay, this resonates with me. So I have a few that I, I, I've asked him if I could keep sure. on using, like, food grown with care by people who care. I think that really sums it up really nicely. I really like that one. Um, like when we were, you know, I've been doing winter farming for eight years now. Uh, I just, I'm just coming up with a book. Uh, when I was young and he was talking about winter farming, he would say it's like climbing the topless mountain I was like I like that yeah it's like it's you we're never you know it's, it's always it's always a challenge or something new there is a few that really kind of inspired me to yeah grow grow better not bigger that's what I've been teaching all my career and it comes from Elliot through inspiration like that the Market Garden Institute monumental task it's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank our, you. Everybody that on our team that has gone through it, we like to talk about it. It's, it's, it's a fun topic around here. And 
and drives a lot of what we think about whenever we're we keep the small farmer in mind of everything that we're doing of course think about that tap root that we had a second ago there's not just one there's there's multiple tap roots that come up along the way and, and opportunities that you have to either weed or cultivate yeah the cultivation of, the, of that course and the book i would love to hear just some thoughts of now that you've been in it for so long the original push and the inspiration for that well it's uh how much time do we have it's a long story <laughs> i'm on your clock <laughs> man. uh you know the book when we got when we came back we eventually we were on rented land lived in, we lived in a teepee for two years here so that's really how we got into farming, really from the, you know, not the high road, from the, you know, from, from the grass root on up. Um, we bootstrap it. That's we'll sure. take it. We'll take it. Yeah. Eventually, we bought a big barn. It's a rabbit house, and it had two acres, and that, that became the gardens. And we went to Cuba that winter because we lived in, the, in a teepee. Uh, we spent our winter in Cuba and in France. I think that's a good call. And then we saw those permanent raised beds in Cuba. And that was the year, that was one of the last few years. They had a 10-year period where they didn't have any fossil fuel on the island. No, no, no gasoline for the tractors, no tractor parts, no herbicides, pesticides, no chemical uh, fertilizers. These are all petroleum-based. So it was 100% organic, 100% handmade, permanent raised beds, and you would have hundreds and hundreds of those beds. They were on a cement contour slab. And I was like, wow, okay, so you can really do multi-acre farming without tractors. We, we saw it. And that was our first kind of like design thing that we did at the farm was that. Um, and then we farmed there for eight years, uh, quite successfully. And I, was, I kept hearing how people were discouraged with farming when... Farms were not making it financially. People weren't taking vacations. Uh, I would sometimes hear numbers of sales of a farm. It was like a seven-acre farm making 110 uh, gross. And we were making more than that on an acre and a half. And I was like, something's up. So eventually, uh, I wanted to share what we were doing. And Modela and my wife, to tell you this, I couldn't sleep at night anymore. It was that, that, that idea of writing a book about what we were doing was so present in me that I, I couldn't sleep. And it lasted for many months until finally I said, you know what, I think I need to do this. There's, there's, there's a calling here. And, you know, we, we were strapped on cash. We had two young ki kids. Uh, farming was, you know, everything. And so I was taking a sabbatical for a full year to write the book. I borrowed money. We hired an extra person, and I started to write full-time for a year. Uh, it was a big, big, uh, it was a big bet. And uh, the book got refused a few times. I even paid for the illustration. I paid for the editing. I, I, I did it all. Eventually, the book became what it is now. I, and I think about those iconic illustrations yeah I, I mean everybody can picture them what they look like yeah and how well done they were you know i remember marie is the name of the girl that did the the, the drawings i was writing it's really hard to write so now i've gone i've become better at it but it was really hard for me to write and I mean, it's just such a left-hand turn into a whole new skill set. oh yeah and then writing the book about what we were doing i was really realizing why we were doing was working also there was some of that i was doing a lot of researching now it was confirming all that we were doing but putting it in a different light and we had trained people a long time enough so that i knew how to explain how to how you know what we were doing but there was this whole concept of you know two acre farm or less 100k per acre but what I, where I want to go is like, I, would, I was writing and then Marie would send these drawings. And it, for two weeks, I was on a high. I was like, okay, this project is happening. Like, I'm not wasting my time here. And then she would send a new batch. And that would really encourage me. And so the book came out. It came out in French. It got pretty popular. It came out in English. It became pretty popular. 
still is pretty popular. I still think to today it's a really good book to start with. It's a, it gives you it gives you what we're doing here. That's the guideline. I was telling him at breakfast, there's not a farm I've been to that there's not at least one copy. Mm -hmm. And wore out. Yeah. I mean, these things are, are not pristine. <laughs> I mean, they're just, they're rowed in and they're they're torn and they're dirty. And And so, you know, my conclusion is that Somehow I was a channel for this to pass through. Because I, I, I say it to you, like it, this, the, the urge to do this was beyond me. There's some, there was a higher purpose or a higher force at work. And when I see where the book is now, yes, I did a lot of promoting and I gave a lot of lectures and talks and I still do, but it's far beyond that. And to some degree, you didn't choose that. It, it kind of chose you, yeah, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, the book has a life of its own. And phase two was all these seven years at FQT Farm, which is like, you know, eight acres, 10, 10 crew operation, you know, same concept, permabeds, hand tools, but, you know, we're really high yielding a lot. Double, triple, cropping, everything. Um, and then after seven years there, I wanted to pass on what I've learned also in going more in depth with all the crops. And that's how the master class came to be. So the master class was filmed with my buddy here for five years, looking at all the different operations in details. And that was my guideline for all the new young growers that I was training. It's like, I'm not going to show you everything in, in details. You're going to go over it before. So you have the complete sequence of how to grow eggplants in the, in the greenhouse. You have the complete sequence, study it, and then when we're together, we'll make sure that we're applying. Right. And then we've opened it to the world, and now there's more than 4,000 people in the master class. It's a really, really cool community of people that are all growers from all over the world, 90 countries. And I feel like so, from, from the outside looking in on your project, we're considering trends that have come up, environmental concerns that have come up, and the, the amount of updates that have to happen. I mean, how... How are you guys choosing, or, or is there even a choice as to this is getting updated or we're adding this section? That's a good question. I'm not updating anything. The reason is the master class is not a course on how to run a farm or how to start a farm. It's about how to grow vegetables. And I've learned new tricks since, but how to grow a carrot is pretty much how I do it. And that's what I teach how I grow all the different crops, lettuce, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, whatever. So the master class is more that. And just that for me is the game changer because if you want to be serious in farming, if you're taking 10 years to learn all these things because it takes a full year till you get to do it again, you're planting potatoes and you didn't have the right way to you know, plant them and then it's taking a full year for you to do it again, if we can shorten that, that apprentice curve, that learning curve, that's really where people will be, you know, they'll sur surpass my level of expertise really fast. Right. They'll suck everything that I've learned through 15 years of doing it. And in year five, they're going to be way beyond where I was, like you know, way and, beyond. And the fundamentals are the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. What's going to change is the growing zone, their exposure. The varieties, their new, market. New tools. Right. New tools, uh, you know, all the business and economic acumen skills that you need to have, that's going to change. Software is evolving. But in the end, you know, we're, what we're doing is, was relevant 30 years ago and it's going to be relevant, I hope, in 30 years. Guy, I can't see robots doing this. Right. Semi off topic, but I mean, you, your media team was here, we're here. How do you guys approach all of the different ways people want to learn? Some people need a book. Some people like the book as a supplemental to audio. Some people want to watch the videos. I know a lot of people come to your in-person trainings. Mm -hmm. And as, as both people that are making content for a lot of different people and regions and personality types, I mean, what's... <laughs> well, I where think do you I, even start? Yeah, I, I think it's great to have all these options. Like, right. honestly, like... If I was a young grower, I probably would have picked a few classes, a few books. You know, I, I did read a lot of books from different growers. 
Um, for me, as, as an educator now, how I see things is like, I teach what I do. And I have a lot of experience doing it. And what we do works. There's a, there's a proven track record for not just me, but for hundreds of farms. And so if you want to learn what I do, come to me. If you want to learn what some other grower is doing or some other kind of style of growing, if you want to learn bokashi and all those those different strategies, you know, that's not me. Like I, I teach what I do. So that's my cutoff. The crops that are in the book, they're mainstays. They're never going away. That's to some degree the, the cash crops. Is there any is there any crops that you see over and over again that you just wish people would skip over and, and work on those fundamentals? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of crops that people could improve on. It's like and I it doesn't take me a million years to see it. Like I, I walk in a field and I'm like, okay, this is this is dialed, this is not. I think greenhouse production, there's a massive opportunity for people to learn how to grow better. Uh, without having more tunnels, but just like putting heat in their tunnels, learning how to graft plants, learning how to, you know, better read plants, how to lower and lean, how to, you know, just like work with the plants and the temperatures. That for me is a game changer because you can double and triple your production with the same amount of work. Right. Just by learning the proper skills. So that's clearly one. Winter farming is another one. Like people, they, you know, shut down their operation in, in climates that are way warmer than we have here. And we grow year round yeah. and we make a profit with these greens in the, in, the, in the greenhouse. So that's another area where I see that there can be improvement. And besides that, you know, you guys are into microgreens. I think adding a microgreen program is, is, is a good idea. Like, I've never myself wanted to specialize in that because I've always thought, you know, I'm good at this. Right. So I want to focus on this. But I think having a microgreen uh, program built into your operation, that's great. Eggs, I would think, is not so bad. Uh, I would not go into fruit trees and I would, animal husbandry. That's for me, it's like it's a whole other trade. Right. Seed saving, for me, it's a whole other trade. But I could see saving one or two uh different variety on this farm and then being part of a collective right to add some extra income i've always encouraged people to consider the total amount of growing that they have because we all have things we personally want to mm -hmm. do that don't make sense for the market yeah and just reserve you know three five percent of the farm for your own itch scratching seed saving yeah that kind of thing so we're not saying you can't do it yeah more. but Let's just try it on a very, very small, small level. For sure. Let's say you're growing, you're growing 40 different crops, which is what we're doing. You need to know what your five money makers are. And these are the ones that you need to put more attention to. So these are the ones that you need to be very aware of. You need to put more time on these ones. You need to have a better price for these crops. So, you know, my take is you can grow them all. But at least the five ones that you know, because it's mathematic, the ones that are bringing in more income, you need to put more time in. You mentioned earlier about the, the farm in Cuba, the long tools, the yeah. hand tools. Yeah. Uh, if we're considering building the farm, what are your non-negotiables? Like everybody wants to, to grow. If I was going to start a farm from scratch, what would you do with that? What could you not do without? Vermont cart. Super expensive, but I, I, you know, it's, so, it's such a big part of moving things around and the way that the wheel span rolls over the 30 inch beds. Uh, the broad fork for me, the broad fork in the last few years got a little bit of a bad rep because people are thinking, oh yeah, an acre and a half, are you broad forking an acre and a half? We're not. We're broad forking perhaps a third of an acre and we're not doing it all at once. Because of the rows. Yeah. yeah, and and plus it's just like we're, we're, we're broad forking, you know, the crops that have a deep rooting system. So that's a tool that I think is a game changer, especially with everyone that's super high on no-till. They forget that, you know, you could be no-till and have super poor quality soils because of your ideology. Doesn't mean that you're thinking no-till that you have good soil. Right. Like the broad fork will tell you, if you're planting the broad fork and it's coming in so sweet 
that it's like in butter, you don't need to till. If you're having a hard time getting your broad fork into the ground, you should be broad forking. Like there's no way in hell that your strategy is good because you need to see it as a root. The root tells the story. It goes down. And if you want to have close spacings in the biointensive way, those roots, they need to be able to shoot down. Otherwise, it, they're, going to go, they're going to hit the hard pan or they're going to... You see that a lot with no-till farmers like gardeners. They, they're, they're just layer over. If you dig a little bit, you have uh, the bottom layers like not good soil. The roots won't go there. They'll, they'll go sideways. And that could, you could have a farm that has the best soil ever and just next door hit that hard pan or hit a, a, sure. a shale. I mean, sure. it really takes some investigation. Having you, that, you idea, need to dig. You having need that to ideology, you're right. You, that's great. But if your property or, or the, the plot you're working on tells a different story than the next. Yeah. And, and if your own plot doesn't tell you the good story, like you'll see if your crops are receptive. So a broad fork, that would be like, I think the stirrup hose, for me, they're the best tools out there to cultivate, for sure. I don't see them going away. Mm. Having a good bed preparation rate, for me, is a big, big part of making sure that your beds are really sweet and nice, level and firm. Uh, and then, you know, I'm a big advocate of the BCS walking tractor because I use it a lot. I like it a lot. I think it's super well adapted to small acreage. But... I could do it with a small compact tractor if the farm was big enough, or I could do it with a wheel hoe if the farm was smaller. So, you know, with that, insect nets, uh, black tarps, greenhouses, irrigation system, can't do without that. Yeah, for sure. Like, you need to have an irrigation system. Hauling water from one place to the other doesn't make any sense. Cold room, can't, can't do without it. Like, you need a cold room misconception is like it's fresh so i'm harvesting it the morning of the har of the delivery date good luck good luck bad idea vegetables are not cooled down enough you'll always be the late one to the market so there's a few of them out there when i started it, it added up to about forty thousand. we recently at the institute uh did another kind of go around and now we're more like at 90. yeah so it's not the same game but the prices are higher also. For sure. So a bunch of carrot was $2 20 years ago. Now it's easily four in many places. At the farmer's market, a lot of people see that as the end game. Like we're going to sell here. Uh, I, I know you've, you've got a lot of stuff going on. So how can people view the farmer's market as more of a mechanism to upsell and to get your other services in front of people while still making a sale? Mm -hmm. I think those cards. Square reading cards. I'm sidetracking your question a little bit, but I think now with the fact that you have a, a store presence, you're at farmer's market, this is, you have a store presence, you have a client, but you can still do a lot of e, you know, online marketing or email marketing. For sure. Or even Facebook marketing, whatever. Not Facebook marketing, but you can still kind of present what's there when you're not there. And so your back store is, is like... When I started farming, you didn't have a backstory. You had, you had your crops laid out and, you know, pile them high and watch them fly. I've always explained that to all the growers that I'm, I'm helping out there. But the, the, the backstory was for your extra crops. Now you can have charcuteries, you can have wine, you can have, you can have cheese, you can have whatever, because people will know and they'll come and get it. Right. And I think that's kind of because, you know, farmer's market, you don't have... 40 feet wide boots. You have 10, 20. If you have a bigger farm, 30. But so your back store is, becomes interesting. You know, and speaking of the posting and, and using all those tools available, to me, you're reminding your clients months in advance, hey, we, right now we are thinking about what you're going to be eating months from now. Storytelling. We're, we're using the silage charge. We're hauling these sandbags around. We're, we're broad forking. Now we're we're seeding, we're transplanting, and every week they get this, or hopefully multiple times a week, they're getting this, this reminder. Yep. Farmers growing things because they care. We, we care about this so far in advance. And when it comes time to, okay, $4 carrots a bunch, maybe they're $6 a carrots. And the price is undeniable because you've been reminding these people that these carrots, have, they just didn't appear. I agree so much. And all the tools are there. They're free. Yeah. 
Um, the beauty also of what and you, we're... And you don't have to be an expert. I'm no, sorry. You, no, no, no. That, but that's, that's the big no, thing. I don't know how to do this. No. Just do it. Yeah. And, and it's funny, like, now, you know, I'm super well marketed. Like, you know, you'll have Facebook ads for, to sign up for my courses and it's all neat. It's all nice. But that's, that's another story. Like, just like take your phone and, and tell the story. Okay, this week uh, we're having rain and it's, you know, it's a hard day, but I'm looking forward. Things are coming up. Hey, everyone. And you're talking to your customers, not to the Facebook right. world. You're talking to your customers. You have a group for your customers. Or... And for you in particular, you're not talking to the farmers that you're teaching. You're talking to these people that you've done this work for. Exactly. And, and I just see that this is the story. The storyline is so important. That's how we compete against big farms, big industrial farms, because we have real marketing, which is our stories, our smiles, our presence. Um, but unfortunately, not everyone's kind of aware of these things, the importance of storytelling. And it, it needs to be genuine, but it's super important. And you're right, like we, you can sell in advance or share, you can talk in advance about what you're doing. You can ask the community if they want to help on something or something else. So it's, it's all about not having an operation that's too big. Like if you have a CSA of 800, it's not the same as if you have a CSA of 150. 800, you're kind of not in real interaction with everyone, but right. you know, 200 customers, 300 customers, you can manage to know them pretty well, quite well. And that's, I think, the beauty of small-scale farming is like to really have a local, local scene. And if you price it appropriately and extend the season, go into winter marking, 800 people over six months, the 400 people over 12 months, it's a hell of a difference. That's a big difference. So we talked about the farmer's market. That's a, a mechanism to sell CSAs. We talked a little bit about that. I'm going to go back to the old mill again. Now that you have been on both sides of restaurant owner, farmer, you've been on both sides of that equation. How has owning this and being a part of this with your team changed your approach to farming, if any? It may not. Well, it's different style because here I'm not producing volumes. Like I'm not pumping out produce. What I need to do is make sure that everything is super well calibrated, that the quality is really there with everything. You know, we won't harvest big bunches. We'll harvest single carrots. And we want to grade them so that they're all the same size because it's just it's easier in the plates. We'll do some bulk harvesting for soups and and stews, but so it's more it's more manite. And there's also crops that flowers that I knew I didn't know about. Like we're growing um, spelt here. Like I've never grown that before because they want to use it in the kitchen. So it's really interesting how they're asking me for stuff that I've never really thought about growing. So it keeps me interested. And um, yeah, and I like, this, I, like being, I like telling the story of this. Telling the story of a winter radish. How it keeps for the whole winter and then it's purple inside. Then it's, like people don't know that. I was, um, I was in your radish field yeah. this morning. And I was just, it's remarkable how many different things were at different stages. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. I told you I was going to accuse you of being an elder statesman. So we're, there we go. We're, we're, we're both about the same age. Uh, and I'm viewing, of course, I, th I think both of us, again, we've been so many places, talked to so many pe people. I'm, we have to look at things completely different mm. uh, with the way we approach things. You, I didn't want to do what I was doing forever. You, you're, you see that. There's some other opportunities for you not to farm every single day yep. in, the, in probably the near future. And that's something you really can't tell yourself on day one or year one. No. Uh, and so if you could give some advice for somebody, it's like, look, you, you're, not, you're not going to be able to do this forever at this pace. Or, and I'm sure you see it through the classes, we have a lot of people, this is their second career. This yep. is their retirement income. And they're coming into this at 50, fresh. Yeah, I think you can actually, because my wife's been doing it for 20 years straight. And she's still excited about next year, and she's excited about the year after. And, you know, we talked a little bit about Elliot Coleman, but 
he's 85 or 84 and he's still, you know, my, my, my friend Romain from Terra Tech was at his place last week and still excited about talking about everything farming. And, and I'm so, not saying the excitement dwindles, <laughs> but, but the workload, that, that load of wood's got to get moved somewhere, exactly. right? Exactly. However, I'll, I'd say this, like when we stop moving the wood, then we stop getting in shape. For sure. So for me, I'm really busy with other things because I, I need to kind of be an administrator for other projects. But this is where I want to spend my time. And I'm happy doing that. And for me, kneeling and harvesting is not an issue. Uh, heavy loads are not an issue. Uh, big days are not an issue. The issue for me is, you know, I don't have six days a week to do right. that. Like I have perhaps four. Things so, in motion tend to stay in motion. Yeah. So I, I would I would think that you can be a small scale farmer for a long time. I don't think that's a problem. If you if you like doing that, you prefer to do something else, then it's it's another story, you know. Well, and I ask that question also because injuries happen. Yeah. You know, and, and there's things that just come up in life that may inhibit that. You've done well because you've been able to diversify, evolve. We can all evolve in some way. And look, maybe that maybe that's the bottom line is you you get chronic arthritis or something like that or, or something happens in your family life. You can't dedicate the time. Yeah. There's still other, other avenues you can pursue. Oh, yeah. And there's people that can help on the farm. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you should always, we're talking about sound advice. You should always be on your farm the fifth wheel. You should always be the spare tire. Right. That's the way to set up a farm for it to be durable in times. Like you need to be the extra, the extra hand. But every, you know, every, everything needs to be organized so that the workload gets done without you. That's how you run a farm. It takes time. Yeah. But because when, when that wheel falls out and you don't have that extra, that, that spare tire, you're fucked. And that, that can really, create a lot of mismatch and problems and so the way I've setting I'm setting up things is like I'm organizing it so that if I'm not there that's it's okay but I'm there right I'm still there but I you know and I, I've learned that from kitchens like a, an executive chef like a real real good chef has the time to make sure that the dishes are hot and warm mm -hmm. He's not buried away in in cooking too much. He's also ha he has a view of everything, yeah, and he has and to make appearances at the front of the house and at the meetings. And exactly, we like to look at things from from all sides, right? So we've we've talked about employees, we've talked about our families, we've talked about ourselves being on the farm and what it looks like for our clients. But there's this whole other thing out there of just the general public. We mentioned it earlier about they just they don't have local food mm. as any kind of thought in their head as they go about living their life. So if you had something that if you had one thing that you could tell a Super Bowl sized arena full of people that wasn't in farming about small farming, what would that be? Oof. Never, I've never seen it like that. If I had a Super Bowl sized stadium. Like, I think we nailed it earlier when we were talking about all these farms being present. That's how we create the movement because they talk to their family, they talk to their friends. They, you know, that's how, you, that's how we kind of spread the message is like having all these different ambassadors. Um, but how do we go from the other way here, bringing back to local economics? I think there, there should be better awareness around the freshness of things and, and it doesn't need to be elitist to eat fresh. Right. Um, you know, and look, I, I don't really know actually. That's why this ambassador role is so important. There's no way we're, there's no way that somebody's going to give us that arena, right? No. So the arena has to be taken by all these ambassadors yeah. of farmers yeah. that we spoke of earlier, yeah. going out to the market and doing their thing exactly. and showing up with something worthy of stopping people. Just that, the thousands of people, the friends that are packing up to the market that are going. It's a bottom-up approach. Yeah. It's not a top-down approach. It's a bottom-up approach. It's a community-level approach. It's, uh, it's, it's really about, you know, replacing, you know, mass production with production by the mass. You know, that sums it up a bit kind of simply, but it is what it is. Like, like why not? 
Like, why have four breweries for the whole U.S. when you can have 400,000 or 440,000? You know, why would we choose one over the other? I prefer to live in a world where there's diversity and there's cultural things happening around food. and Farming is a seven-day-a-week job. Six. 365 Six. days. I'm Six. getting there. I'm getting there. So if, the, if we are going to have a sustainable farm, mm. it, sounds like, it sounds like you already have a no compromise. It's six days, period. Mm. Yeah, for sure. A lot of people miss that. They're also missing other things. So in year one, year five, the mm. things that we're not making time for. Never go seven. Because what happens when you go seven, it's proven. You end up doing less work. Because you're more tired. You need, to, you need to stop one day, recharge, refresh the battery, think about something else. Get the fresh eyes. Like, just like take a break and go with the kids or have a bike ride, get drunk on Saturday, whatever. It's like you just need to have a break and do something else. But <clears throat> yeah, I think six, six days for sure. Like farming five days, that, that's kind of pulling it a little bit. But seven is, is, is totally out of question. And then also you need to have at least three weeks off the farm once a year, minimum. Not to go visit other farms. You can, <laughs> but you need to be elsewhere. You need to be thinking about other things. You need to leave those problems behind you. You need to make sure that you are changing your mindset, like a real reset. You know, two weeks is the minimum, but three weeks is really the minimum. Where you're thinking about other stuff, you're traveling, you're moving around, you're, you're doing other stuff. Because if you, if you stay two weeks at home, you end up working anyway. So you need to recharge your battery, change your mind. That for me is also a no, it's no compromise. Last question. Yeah. Your most memorable eating experience. Ooh, that's a good question. It's the core of what we do. It has to be important, right? I think it would have to be uh, something around fine dining because it's not my favorite place to eat uh, a fine dining restaurant because i prefer to have a local pizza here right with you know, a good bottle of wine and just like in the sun for me that's that's i'm king like that fresh veggies from the garden but the decorum and the whole atmosphere and the whole kind of game of it's the celebration of what it, we do exactly i like that i like that and i, I more than more than before like it's not that i need fine dining it's just like I like that, and um, yeah. You know, one one year I was I was at Dan Barber's super expensive yeah. famous restaurant, um, and they served me a salad of green manure, and I was like, "Well, this is interesting." And everything around what we were eating, the storytelling was so right on. Like even for me, I was like, well, "That's that's really clear. That's really clever." And I was thinking, wow, all these people listening to these stories. Um, I don't say that that would be my best, but that was something that I, I, I'm still reminded of. And uh, there's another super famous French uh, chef. His name is Alain Passard, and he's in France, and he has a farm. And he invited me to visit his farm. And we had a meal together, and uh, his whole staff was cooking for us because they really loved him. Because he never, never took the time to sit down and eat. And uh, I don't know why he did that with me. But then you could feel the love of all of his staff for him. And I was like, wow, I want to be loved like that. And that was memorable for me. I love that question because it reminds us all that past the sale, past the growing, this food is, is going to... Or has the opportunity to make a memory for somebody. Yeah. And it's, it just it shows that it's so much further beyond our day-to-day -day tasks. That's what I tell my staff here. It's like, you don't know when somebody is coming. It might be the, the only time of the year that they're coming out for dinner. Right. So every time they walk in here, let's them, let, let them make feel special. And I, I'm not here all the time, but when I'm here, I go to tables and I say hi and I know that some, a lot of people come because they, they know of me, they appreciate my work. And I take the time because exactly that. Like, caring is important. And when people feel cared about, it, it's just like it has a good experience to it. Well, I mean, this is as sincere, as sincere as I can possibly be. 
on behalf of all farmers for oh. you've been such an inspiration for mm. so many people it's from our side of things it seemed rather selfless i mean you're just you've always been here uh i started out with a book and, and like i said i know a lot of other people have so on behalf of bootstrap farmer and everybody else out there thanks for hosting us here and for the great talk and just for everything you thank you thank you for those kind words appreciate it appreciate it uh, hopefully i'll be around for much longer uh you need to come back when we could have a meal together at the old mill that'd be very nice so all right well until we come back that's all folks all right stay safe everyone be well well thanks man that's great i'm glad you liked it uh, i'm 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 disappointed that the restaurant's not open well, uh, I always say that it takes us forever to get somewhere the first time, but then usually uh, the second time isn't so hard. So we'll be back.